The world is held back by, by fear. I think everybody knows it. And every once in a while you get to see moments of, of true heroism and selfless action and people acting out of inspiration, out of passion. What we represent uh, is, is fearless choice to, to go with bliss. And I think that's, that's pretty darn cool. And so uh, my, my passion for studying fear, for studying how do we get out of a fear state, how do we get from a negative state of mind, a negative emotional state, into the optimum performance state, right? When you have the perfect skydiver, the perfect flight, or anything else, it's because you're in a good mood. You know, I mean, you certainly have good reason after your success to be in a good mood. But I really do believe that when we perform the best, it's because we're having fun. So how do we get from feeling like crap because the airplane's bouncing around on the way to altitude and you're on borrowed gear and it's kind of dark and you know where <laughs> all these things adding up um, can make us feel pretty lousy and we cannot perform very well when we're feeling like that. So what I've been studying is the physiological and cognitive aspects of this journey from feeling like crap to feeling great. So I write about that and I speak about that and uh, it's, uh, it will continue for the rest of my life to be my passion. So this is why I like to, to show up and talk to businesses and uh, government people and military people and remind you something that you probably already knew is that when you're smiling, you're into your skill. What I'm trying to promote when I go out and I speak is I'm trying to promote the best version of you. I mean, of course, I'm trying to promote the best version of me. When I jump out of an airplane, I want to perform to the best of my ability, not only because it protects me from danger, but it also is more fun. Skill is better on every level. So how does that fit in with your job? You're, you might already be starting to, to ask a few questions as I'm talking about this. When you're do, getting into a situation where emotions are starting to get charged up, taking a deep breath. That's what James was saying. Wake up to the fact that you need to take a deep breath. That's a hard thing to do when you really need a deep breath, right? I notice when I'm hanging under a parachute that's not opening properly, when I really need to stop for a moment, calm down, clear my head, not try to think anything for just a moment, start to feel better, and then look for the solutions from that state of mind, ooh, that's a hard thing. That's like enlightenment. <laughs> it really is. That's why I, I think that it would be good to put stickers everywhere you go that says breathe. You know, put it in your wallet every time you open your wallet, put it in your car when you put it on your steering wheel maybe, take a deep breath, right? To me, that's, that's the moment of awakening. And we all do it. The question is how often do we do it? Can we do it more? If there's anybody in the room that thinks that they're doing it enough, you should take the microphone. Because <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that I am. You know, I mean, not just when I'm giving a talk, but you know, when I'm holding my son and he's crying and he's screaming, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm letting my own, my own emotions sort of get attached to that and I'm, he's taking me for a ride. Something we've all probably figured out is that if you wait for the world to soothe you, you could be waiting a while. <laughs> and it comes back again to what William James was trying to, to teach us about emotion is that we can't do it with thought alone because the thoughts that we have access to at the time are limited based on how we feel at the time. In skydiving, we have something we call the gut check. We hear it in scuba diving. My wife is big into the deep cave diving and stuff. They talk about gut check too. So before you get into the situation, how does it feel right here? If it doesn't feel good, there's one of two possibilities. One is you are unprepared and you should go the other way. Don't do it. I've been saved by a lot of those decisions. Antennas that I've climbed down because I didn't feel right jumping off of it. Lots of situations where we've de-escalated, we've avoided the danger by going the other way because we simply were not ready for it in one way or another. The other possibility is that it's just my neurosis. Again, it's just my, yeah, but what if it goes bad? Because right? when you're looking off of this direction, right, off into the distance of what if it goes badly? Because right? we need to do that. Right? As, a, as a parent, as an adult in this world, you have to be able to look into a situation and get a glimpse of what if it doesn't go well? Do I have an answer to that? If I don't, I better feel worried and that worry should cause me to go the other way. Don't do it. But if we stare in that direction, here's the problem. Because then you're telling the story of what that's going to be like and you're going to find a way to either make it happen 
or make yourself feel terrible. And you're not in the alternate set of answers, which is, okay, that's, that would be the worst case scenario. Deep breath, okay, what would be the best case scenario? What if this all went well, you know? What if your job, what if you in your job was being the best that you can possibly be? To me, this is the flow state. Flow state isn't only an athletic state of mind. It's a life state of mind where I am really on a roll and I'm having a good time and I'm looking further into the direction of what if things went well? What if there was an answer to this? Right? So when you're in a, you ever been in a meeting where everybody's going, here's the problem, this is the problem, that's the other part of the problem, and this is the, and all you're doing is talking about the problem. Can you get to the answer from there? <laughs> right? So what if we were to, in a meeting, say, okay, you know, somebody be, is the, the real sort of thermometer that says we've gotten off track here. Let's just stop for a second. Have a donut. <laughs> okay, maybe a whole week piece of bread. <laughs> and drink some water, you know, and kind of get ourselves feeling good. It all takes is two minutes most of the time. All right, back on track. What does on track mean? Looking for the answers that make you feel better. There's a lot of answers and they're specific to your career. They're specific to your role. And only you know what they are. In every new situation, there's going to be a different specific set of answers. But you can't reach for them. You can't even see them when you're beating the drum of the problem. Complaining, complaining, complaining. We have a whole culture built, about, built upon complaining. I'm from New York. I've lost a bit of my accent, but it still comes out once in a while. New Yorkers, man, they have a skill that they've developed. Complaining, whining all the time. But they do it in a very different way than the rest of the country. They whine with humor. Right? It's, they make it funny. Complain about the trap. Oh, it was so bad, I gotta tell you, right? And that's that's not such a bad thing. That if we lose our sense of humor, we're lost. This positive state of mind involves a sense of humor, especially when you're scared, right? If you can't dissolve the intensity, the density of this by humor, right, turn it into vapor, you can't see your way out of the problem. A sense of humor is a pretty important thing when you're in an airplane getting ready to jump out. If you can't giggle, right, that's how I know. If my student is really nervous and they're about to make the worst case scenario come out, I tell a joke and they don't laugh. They go, <laughs> right?